Um, okay, uh, hello and welcome everyone. Um, my name is Maya Vinikor and I teach in the Department of Russian and Slavic Studies here at NYU. And I'm really glad to welcome you to this um, latest installment in our lecture series uh, on Ukrainian energy studies. So first a few words about the series um, in case you are attending today for the first time, um, and then I will introduce our speaker. Um, so this is an interdisciplinary series that explores the concept of energy as a shaping force in Ukrainian cultural and political policy, the aesthetics of particular energy sources like fossil fuels, nuclear energy, renewables um, in uh, Ukrainian literature, film, and other media, uh, the Russia-Ukraine energy nexus, Ukrainian energy market markets, and environmental effects of energy production, consumption, and catastrophe. Um, the series is not only uh, interdisciplinary, but interinstitutional. Inter it is co-organized by, of course, the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia here at NYU and the East European, Russian, Caucasian, and Central Asian Faculty Network at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, we'd like to thank our co-sponsors, uh, namely, of course, the Jordan Center itself, but also the departments of Germanic and Slavic Languages and Literatures, History, Geography, and Political Science, and the International Affairs Program at CU Boulder. Uh, and of course, as always, thank you so much to Satish Patalnik, whose uh, logistical and organizational support makes all this possible. Uh, so if you're if you're interested in this series, uh, you can check the Jordan Center website for announcements of future events, or you can sign up for our mailing list to get actual like Zoom links for the upcoming talks. I can say that the next ones on our roster are not until spring 2023, in particular in April. Um, but our schedule is constantly being updated. So uh, please uh, please signal your interest in some way and we can keep you apprised of the talks. So uh, after that preamble, I'm now happy to actually introduce our speaker. Um, so Per Hugzelius is professor of in the history of technology and international relations at KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Um, he holds an MSc in engineering physics, a PhD in innovation studies, and is a docent or habilita habilitation degree in the history of science and technology. Uh, his teaching and research spans the history of energy in its multiple forms, natural resources, and technological infrastructures, with a particular focus on transnational aspects. Uh, his English language publications include uh, Red Gas, Russia and the Origins of European Energy Dependence from 2013, Europe's Infrastructure Transition, uh, Economy, War, and Natured, uh, co-authored with Arne Kaiser and Eric uh, van der Floyten in 2016, and 2019's Energy and Geopolitics. In Sweden, he is also active as an author of popular science books and essays. Uh, he currently leads the ERC project Nuclear Waters, Putting Water at the Center of Nuclear Energy History, uh, which run, ran from 2018 and will continue into 2023. So his talk today is called Ukraine in the Pan-European Natural Gas System. Um, so please join me in welcoming Per Huxilius. Let me hand the floor over to you. Thank you so much. And uh, it's uh, great to be invited to present uh, some of my research in this um, in this uh, series. Um, and uh, I will now try to share my slides. Here we go. So I hope you can see this. Um, so I'm, I'm a historian of technology, and uh, this means uh, that I will be, on the one hand, very uh, historical uh, today. Uh, uh, and actually, I must warn you that I've decided to uh, focus mainly on a pretty early period in, uh, in Ukrainian uh, energy history, mainly up to around uh, 1975. Uh, and then on the other hand, uh, I am going to be uh, rather technical or at least uh, very geographical. Uh, and uh, But I, I hope you can bear with me <laughs> uh, in, in any way. So we, we all know that Ukraine's uh, relations with Russia uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union have been strongly shaped by natural gas imports uh, from Russia and also then by transit of Russian natural gas uh, through Ukraine uh, to uh, Western and uh, Central Europe. Uh, even today, in spite of Russia's war on Ukraine, natural gas from uh, Siberia continues to be transited uh, through Ukraine to Western Europe. Uh, according to business contracts between Russian and Ukrainian gas companies, uh, 
this happens at the very same time as Russia terrorizes civilians and destroys critical infrastructure all over Ukraine. It's uh, I mean, counter it you into, uh, to say the least, I think. But it is actually a material reality that we have to somehow uh, try to be aware of and, 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 and relate to. And I suspect that that might come up for, for discussion later on today also. But uh, how can we explain this centrality of natural gas in uh, Ukraine's history and Ukraine's international relations? Um, or more specifically, how did Ukraine attain such a central role in not only the Soviet, but the pan-European natural gas uh, system. This is uh, uh, what I would like to discuss with you uh, today, essentially. And uh, the story starts uh, already in the interwar period. Uh, 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 or actually, um, we can go back to the period before uh, World War I. Uh, at that time, uh, uh, as uh, all of you know, I think uh, Ukraine didn't exist on uh, any political maps, uh, and Western Ukraine uh, uh, was uh, called Galicia, right, and uh, sorted uh, under the Habsburg Empire. Uh, several authors have uh, pointed out that uh, Galicia uh, came to function as something like a resource colony at that time, uh, whose natural resources were exploited for capitalist profit by Austrian and uh, also by German and other companies, and uh, then brought uh, west from, from, from Galicia. These resources included uh, most uh, famously Galicia's uh, oil resources, which for uh, people living at that time were uh, truly immense, uh, although maybe by today's standard, uh, they're almost negligible. Uh, Alison Frank and others have uh, written about this. Uh, it's a very exciting story in its own right. Uh, uh, other resources included uh, uh, timber, uh, which uh, historically was uh, mainly used for local purposes. Uh, but uh, in the age of railways, they uh, started to be extracted on a much larger scale and then shipped uh, westwards for sale on West European uh, commodity markets. I can recommend here the recent uh, publications uh, uh, by uh, my French colleague, uh, Javad de Heur, uh, 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 we, because I think this uh, uh, this prehistory of oil and timber gives a kind of backdrop to to the natural gas story. Now, after World War One, uh, the Habsburg Empire was split up, and most of Galicia ended up becoming Polish uh, territory. Right, uh, Poland then uh, allowed the extraction of Galician oil uh, uh, to continue, and uh, mobilized it uh, very much for its own industrialization drive. The difference, however, was that not only oil, but also natural gas now started to be extracted in a systematic way. Natural gas occurs uh, geologically very much together with oil, so uh, this shouldn't really come as, as a surprise. Several large gas fields were discovered in the 1920s in, uh, in Galicia, and so this region uh, diversified itself from being an oil region to also becoming an important gas region. But uh, transporting uh, natural gas was much more difficult than transporting oil or timber because you couldn't easily put gas on a train or, or onto a barge and uh, just send it off. Instead, gas industry actors, they had to invest heavily in a pipeline infrastructure. This was uh, an extremely risky business because in case of failure, it would be impossible to use the pipeline for any other purpose. The need for uh, pipelines also meant that the whole gas business could only make economic sense if it became a very large scale business. Transporting small volumes of gas was economically infeasible. You couldn't build a system just uh, for that. But in spite of these challenges, Polish engineers uh, did build enormous gas, not enormous, but <laughs> numerous uh, gas pipelines uh, in uh, Galicia during uh, the interwar years. Uh, most of which uh, originated near a town called Dashava in Western Ukraine, uh, or what would become Western Ukraine, <laughs> uh, where the region's most important gas field was uh, located. In 1929, uh, a 70 kilometer long pipeline was inaugurated that enabled uh, gas from Dashava to supply the Galician capital of Lviv uh, with natural gas. 
Uh, this was a very unusual thing for a European city in the 1920s. Uh, in most parts of Europe at that time, natural gas was a more or less unknown energy source. And even in the United States, uh, which uh, was the world leader in both oil and gas developments, uh, there was uh, there were not yet so many cities that really had access to large volumes of natural gas at that time. Here uh, is a picture that my uh, Polish colleague uh, Sławomir Mortis has found in Polish uh, archives, showing one of these early gas pipelines uh, in Galicia, crossing crossing a river. Polish engineers then, uh, they continued by building longer pipelines, uh, one of which went all the way to Tarnów, uh, which is not far from Krakow in, in, in today's Poland, uh, where the gas was used for that area's important nitrogen works. Then when the Nazis, following Operation Barbarossa in uh, World War II, occupied Eastern Poland, Hitler's engineers followed up on this feat by constructing further very long pipelines. And then in 1944, the Red Army arrived. Right? This had far-reaching consequences for the natural gas system because when Poland's new borders were settled, uh, at least two of the long distance pipelines from Dachawa had somehow as by a magic trick become transnational pipelines. This was because uh, Dachawa was now a part of a region that had become Western Ukraine, while some of the consumer regions remained in what would become uh, communist Poland. So uh, the pipelines themselves, they didn't change at all. Uh, and uh, the gas continued to flow uh, through them in uh, spite of the geopolitical uh, turmoil. Uh, so, uh, so without uh, actually building any new pipelines, uh, uh, we see you know, the rise of the Soviet Union as a, as a natural gas exporter. This is how the Soviets uh, actually started exporting uh, natural gas without them actually building any, any pipelines. Now, the uh, Soviet annexation of Galicia was really decisive for the future of natural gas, uh, not only in Ukraine, but also in, uh, in the Soviet Union at large. The Soviets were very enthusiastic about having conquered this oil and gas rich region, Galicia, which uh, in Russian eyes was, uh, I would say, a pretty exotic uh, Central European region, perhaps even more exotic than uh, Central Asia or, uh, or, or, or the Far East, actually, because it had never uh, belonged to, uh, to Russia before, right? The Soviet oil minister uh, at the time was, uh, or was oil commissar, I think it was called at the time, was. Uh, uh, a man called uh, Nikolai Baibakov, whom we perhaps know better as the later Gazplan uh, chairman. Uh, already before the war was over, uh, Baibakov and his engineers, uh, they sat down uh, at the drawing board in Moscow and started sketching an ambitious new energy system in which Dashava gas deposits uh, would play a key role. They were very impressed by this gas field uh, in, uh, in, um, in, uh, in Galicia. They judged that it had the potential to play a major part in supplying not only Western Ukraine itself, but uh, multiple Soviet regions. Uh, Polish and German engineers, as, as I have uh, said before, uh, had already built uh, pipelines that moved uh, the Shava gas in Western directions. Uh, and this actually then like, remained in uh, operation. Uh, but the Soviets, they radically decided to supplement those flows with much larger ones that would flow in uh, eastern directions. Already before the Red Army had reached Berlin in spring 1945, Soviet workers started constructing, as we see here, a 500 kilometer long gas pipeline from Galicia all the way to Kiev, uh, the Ukrainian capital. Uh, and from uh, 1948, the Galician gas started flowing to uh, Kiev. This uh, substantially helped Kiev uh, to cope with its looming urban fuel crisis that plagued the city in the chaotic aftermath of the war, or that war, uh, we should say. The project's completion was celebrated as a great achievement, uh, and uh, the perceived success motivated Soviet planners to propose an extension of the pipeline uh, even further east. As a matter of fact, it was eventually extended all the way to Moscow, 1,500 kilometers 
away. So these gas fields, which had once upon a time been in Austria and Galicia, they now uh, were used to supply uh, you know, the capital of the Soviet Union. I may add here that uh, Soviet gas system building was not only shaped by concrete material needs for fuel in different parts of the country, uh, it was also shaped by uh, the Kremlin's uh, political strategies. It's uh, uh, pretty fascinating to see how uh, they did this um, uh, because Moscow, they obviously felt a need to ensure that uh, the political and economic integration of a range of newly annexed territories in the West, including much of what had been Eastern Poland uh, and also the three formerly independent Baltic countries of Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia, plus uh, the Königsberg area in uh, what had been Germany's Eastern Prussia. The Soviets thought that Galician natural gas could help them to achieve such integration. Galician gas was uh, already being piped to Kiev and Moscow, as we have seen, uh, but this was actually only the beginning. Encouraged by the discovery of a new large Galician field in the same area, uh, uh, the 1956 Soviet Party Congress decided to construct a new pipeline from Western Ukraine, and it went, as we can see in this picture, it's uh, to the upper left from Dashava, uh, and Western Ukraine then uh, to Minsk, and then uh, also uh, to uh, uh, Lithuania and to uh, uh, Latvia, where it reached uh, the important cities of Vilnius, uh, uh, eventually uh, even Klaipeda, and then the Riga, the, uh, uh, the Latvian uh, capital. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so, th so this was... Uh, um, uh, this was a new uh, a new way of uh, exploiting uh, Galician gas. In this way, uh, three more republics than uh, Belarus, uh, Lithuania, and Latvia got access to uh, to Ukrainian gas. And since all of them largely lacked own fuel resources, the arrival of Galician gas was very much welcomed by uh, the respective republican governments there. Uh, but the side effect of the arrangement uh, was that uh, dependence on Galician gas reduced uh, the prospects to uh, politically break out of the Soviet Union and orient themselves, uh, well, um, economically and politically towards uh, the West, uh, an ambition that actually remained very much alive, particularly in the previously independent Baltic republics for many years after 1945. These uh, uh, pipelines, uh, the Dashava minsk uh, pipeline, and then uh, also the connection with Riga, they started supplying uh, Belarus in uh, 1960, then uh, Lithuania in 1961, and Latvia in 1962. Meanwhile, in eastern Ukraine, uh, things also developed in interesting ways. Uh, uh, here's another map. Uh, and there, uh, a new giant uh, gas field uh, referred to the Shebelinka gas field uh, had been discovered visible uh, in its uh, sprawling complexity here on the right hand side. Of of this map. Uh, it was uh, even larger than the Galician gas field, and it was uh, bound to become uh, one of the most important sources of gas in the Soviet Union as a whole. And some people refer to this field as the largest gas field in Europe. It was uh, conveniently located in the immediate vicinity of uh, several key industrial districts. Uh, it uh, commenced uh, production on, uh, on, on a small scale already in 1956. Uh, initially supplying the uh, heavily heavy industrializing regions uh, around uh, uh, Dnipro and uh, Kharkiv. Uh, uh, later on in the 1960s, uh, Shebelinka gas was also mobilized for strengthening gas supply in Moscow and several cities in between there, uh, such as uh, Kursk and Bryansk. In addition, a pipeline was built westwards from uh, Shebelinka uh, down to Odessa on the Black Sea, and from there onwards into the tiny Moldovan uh, Soviet Republic. Moldova in this way became the sixth Soviet Republic to become reliant on Ukrainian natural gas. So as you see, Ukraine really became a kind of very important hub uh, and center of, of the Soviet uh, natural gas industry in the uh, course of the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s. 
Then the next stage in Ukraine's development uh, as the Soviet Union's most important gas regions was to build pipelines from Ukraine to foreign territories. This started with the construction of a pipeline uh, from Ukraine to Czechoslovakia, referred to as uh, the Bratstvo pipeline. Uh, now, uh, now they're still very much known and very much discussed. Uh, and uh, uh, there was um, a Czechoslovak uh, Soviet agreement uh, on this project uh, signed in January 1964. And here on this map, you can see how the Czechoslovaks envisioned that Ukrainian gas would strengthen their country's gas supply system with the Ukrainian gas coming in here to the, to the lower right, you see from the, uh, from the eastern. In um, uh, 1965, this line started to be constructed, uh, and like so many other pipelines, it originated in the Dashava area. It then exited the Soviet Union outside the uh, uh, in the scenic uh, Transcarpathian region of what since 1945 was uh, the westernmost corner of the Ukrainian Republic. You know. uh, the pipeline was eventually taken into operation in June 1967, and it was perhaps not surprising that the announcement of this project uh, also triggered the interest of neighboring Austria, uh, Bratislava, where the Bratstvo pipeline ended, was just on the Austrian border. And after its completion, only a few kilometers would separate uh, the interconnected Soviet Czechoslovak transmission system from, uh, from the Austrian gas system. Uh, uh, this is a uh, 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 this is the, as you can see here, this is the Austrian engineering vision of how Ukrainian gas being transferred through Czechoslovakia would tie into the Austrian gas uh, system. And it's easy to understand how uh, uh, um, uh, this, uh, th this idea became attractive from an, uh, from an Austrian uh, point of view. Uh, and, uh, and an agreement to uh, uh, connect Austria with uh, the Ukrainian Czechoslovak pipeline infrastructure. It was uh, signed in, in, in June 1968, uh, uh, which is then actually in the midst of the, of the Prague Spring, right? And then already in the September 1968, uh, uh, actually uh, just a few days after uh, the Warsaw Pact's crashing of the Prague Spring, uh, the gas started flowing across uh, the border. And here you uh, see the uh, uh, ceremonious inauguration of this uh, of this system, then. But, but you have to think that this is just a few days after the crushing of the of the Prague Spring. This gas to Austria, then, uh, which was the first Soviet gas to be exported to a capitalist country, it, uh, actually originated in Western Ukraine. And if the Habsburg borders would still have been in place at that time, the gas would then actually have been domestic Austrian gas, right? Uh, because as you remember. Uh, the Western Ukrainian gas fields were actually located in the former Austrian province of Galicia. The late 1960s was also an era of pioneering Soviet gas negotiations and agreements with larger, larger Western countries, uh, notably Italy, Germany, and France. Uh, for gas deliveries to these countries, the Soviet gas ministry judged that Ukrainian gas would not really be enough. Uh, the idea was instead that Siberian gas, uh, not Ukrainian gas, would supply the large West European countries. But actual development of the Siberian field was a long-term challenge. And when the first big gas export contracts were signed between the Soviet Union and Germany, Italy and France in the years around 1970, Siberian gas was not yet available for export. In this situation, the Kremlin judged that Ukrainian gas would actually have to supply these countries too, if only on a temporary basis, whatever temporary meant. Um, exports from Ukraine to Western Germany uh, were then actually uh, started up in uh, autumn 1973 and then uh, to Italy in spring 1974. Now, one question that we might ask here is why the Soviets uh, were uh, in, in such a hurry to start up gas exports to Western Europe. Uh, why not 
uh, wait until Siberian gas uh, would be uh, really available uh, and only then start up exports. Well, this had to do with the fact that uh, the Soviet gas industry needed Western technology uh, and especially they needed large diameter steel pipe and compressor stations in large numbers uh, to exploit the newly discovered gas fields in uh, Siberia. Uh, here we see uh, such pipes uh, in the making uh, in, uh, in Germany. Uh, the Soviet Union was not able to produce these things domestically. They couldn't do it. They didn't have the capacity. Instead, uh, the Soviet gas ministry uh, planned to buy pipes and compressor stations also from Western Europe uh, in exchange for exports of uh, natural gas. And this produced actually kind of catch-22 situation. The Soviets needed Western technology to exploit Siberia uh, and export natural gas, but they needed to export natural gas to access Western technology. So how could they solve this? Well, here, Ukrainian gas then actually came to the rescue. So the plan was to export Ukrainian gas to Western Europe for some time, then use Western steel pipes to build the Siberian gas export infrastructure, and then gradually replace Ukrainian gas with Siberian gas uh, as the main resource uh, to be exported. I hope you can follow this. <laughs> Maybe, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit complex, but, uh, but very, very intriguing, I think. From Moscow's horizon, uh, and also from uh, a West European perspective, it may with hindsight appear as uh, if this bold plan actually worked out very well. We could write such a history in which the Soviet Union and Western Europe cooperated very nicely with each other, exchanging gas for technology, while gradually substituting Siberian gas for Ukrainian gas in terms of gas exports. We, it could be argued that this is precisely what happened and that the plan is very much uh, a success. But there is, as I see it, one problem with such a narrative. Uh, and this is that it totally neglects uh, the European, uh, sorry, the Ukrainian uh, perspective and uh, it, it neglects the Ukrainian experience uh, of how this worked out. Because to Ukraine, uh, this plan, this very bold plan, uh, this geo, uh, um, uh, well, very large scale plan, it had very harsh local negative consequences. And this is very important. And I uh, would now like to uh, elaborate in some detail on what this uh, actually meant in practice. Now, uh, as you remember, the Galician gas fields had, uh, in the course of the post-war decades, come to play a key role in the Soviet gas system. Uh, not only the Ukrainian uh, uh, the Socialist Republic, but uh, four other Union Republics as well, uh, Belarus, Lithuania, Latvia, and to a smaller extent Russia, uh, had become dependent on Galician gas, so Western Ukrainian gas. Small volumes were also exported uh, at Poland uh, along those pipelines that had been built uh, during the interwar period and during the Second World War. In each of these user regions, gas demand grew at a steady pace and production from the Galician fields uh, was uh, gradually scaled up to meet uh, the needs. But towards the mid-1960s, it started to become clear that the Galician fields had been overexploited. Uh, they were being depleted at an alarming rate. And this was only one side of the problem. Uh, the other side of it was that uh, the demand was increasing from, uh, from year to year. Uh, and the reason for these increases was, to a large extent, that uh, Moscow wanted to export natural gas from Ukraine. So it was a very difficult situation. Um, and as a matter of fact, Ukraine was experiencing severe problems with its gas supply already in the mid 1960s, which is before exports to Czechoslovakia and Austria started. This made Ukraine extremely vulnerable to any further uh, potential negative events or trends. So against this background, you can probably imagine that Moscow's ambition to initiate gas exports 
uh, from Galicia to Austria and Czechoslovakia did not really give rise to any enthusiasm in Ukraine, uh, nor in Belarus, Lithuania or Latvia, all of whom depended on Galician gas in one way or the other. Uh, the new export commitments imply that uh, the, comp the competition for Galicia's waning gas resources would tend to toughen. In their correspondence with Moscow, local party organizations uh, show themselves very concerned with the anticipated impact of exports on regional gas security, fearing, and I quote here, severe deterioration of gas supply to the population and to industrial enterprises. So this is what you can read in, in, in Ukrainian and Russian archives about how the local party organizations uh, considered uh, you know, the export prospects. So the Soviet gas ministry was uh, in a very difficult situation. It needed to supply Western Ukraine and Kiev, uh, and it also needed to meet growing export obligations uh, to Czechoslovakia and Austria, and also to Poland along the older pipelines. Uh, now, by refraining from exporting gas, the Soviets could have rescued Western Ukraine. Uh, but uh, as it turned out, the Soviets did not do that. Instead, they prioritized the need uh, to meet export obligations. Uh, and this is very important. Deputy Gas Minister uh, Yuli Boxerman uh, issued a strict directive emphasizing that Export supplies uh, to Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Austria in the volumes of the approved plan must not be cut down. So exports absolutely had to be prioritized. The next priority was Kiev, uh, the Republican capital, which also relied on uh, Galician gas. But then there was a deficit, and it had to be absorbed by someone, and it had to be absorbed by Western Ukraine and by users along the pipeline that stretched from Dashava to Minsk, Vilnius, and Riga. By mid-December 1968, uh, users situated on the latter route were reported to face an acute shortage of gas. And this was at precisely the time when Western Ukrainian gas started flowing to Austria. Now, Austria actually experienced its own problems with its supplies from Dashava. The, the situation uh, gradually improved over the years, however, and both Austria and other West European countries pointed to the imports of Soviet gas to Western Europe as a success, which in turn inspired other countries uh, to conclude gas import agreements with Moscow. What the West Europeans didn't know was that Western Ukraine had to pay a very high price for this export success. We can look, for example, at uh, uh, a number of winters in the, in the early 1970s. Uh, in uh, 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 the winter 1971, 1972, uh, it, it, that was a very cold winter, actually, uh, with temperatures below minus 30 degrees centigrade and enormous problems plagued the gas supply at that time to numerous Ukrainian cities. The pressure fell dramatically on several pipelines. Uh, uh, Lutsk and Rivne were two cities in uh, northwestern Ukraine that competed with Austria and Czechoslovakia for access to scarce Galician gas. Here, uh, schools and other municipal institutions, they had to close because of the gas crisis. Uh, the crisis was deepened by unauthorized increase in gas use from the side of many industrial enterprises. They were not allowed to take gas, but they took gas. Uh, the Ukrainian Council of Ministers uh, referred to an emergency situation. Uh, the crisis could have been avoided, but only if deliveries to Austria and to Czechoslovakia had been reduced. But Moscow deliberately chose to prioritize exports and let its own population freeze. The next winter, 1972-1973, saw a cruel competition between different regions for scarce Galician gas. And again, exports were prioritized. A struggle erupted between Northwestern Ukraine and Belarus, with Belarus trying to prevent Ukraine from taking out its gas needs from the Dashava-Minsk pipeline. For the Ukrainians, uh, 
the fall was a sensitive season actually because of the sugar beet harvest. Uh, and this uh, harvest needed uh, uh, large amounts of fuel to work out. So being, with, being left without ga gas there was uh, causing a great deal of trouble. The situation further worsened during the next winter, 1973, 1974, uh, when the Soviet Union diversified its exports by starting up gas shipments uh, to West Germany and also actually to Eastern Germany. In September, 1973, there was uh, a huge celebration in Bavaria in uh, connection with the inauguration of exports to West Germany. You can read about this uh in in in, um, in newspapers right where they really celebrated this uh drinking champagne and uh and, and so on here shaking hands right uh, uh but the uh, ukrainians they definitely had no good reason to celebrate at the time instead the population was preparing for a cold and chaotic winter it was clear that the looming export commitments which had priority over domestic gas supply would make it impossible to cover the gas needs of many municipal institutions and electrical power stations. Given scarce resources, Gosplan issued a new regulation according to which the municipal and electricity sectors would receive only one third of normal supplies, and in many cases, even less. Supplies to thermal plants that heated houses in Kiev, Lviv, and other cities, they had to be canceled altogether. These had to try and secure alternative fuels like coal or oil, which was not so easy. Internal Soviet complaints about gas shortages starting arriving in Moscow from late uh, October 1973, following the inauguration of exports uh, to Germany. From Belarus, uh, Soviet Premier Kasygin uh, received a letter in which Belarusian uh, party leaders stated that and I quote here, if, an early, if in earlier years, great difficulties were experienced during the coldest months as a result of non-availability of gas, then currently an extremely difficult situation has come about already now in October. End quote. Frustrated complaints uh, also came from uh, Minister of Power and Electrification, uh, Pyotr Neparozhny, who noted that uh, Mini Gazprom so uh, the gas ministry had uh, failed uh, to deliver 100 million cubic meters of natural gas to a number of electric power stations during October 1973. To compensate for the shortage, uh, the power stations had been forced to burn large amounts of valuable reserve fuels in the form of oil and coal. The Ministry of Chemical Industry also complained, particularly concerning the difficult situation at Rivnes, a large chemical combine in northwestern Ukraine, and the important fertilizer plant at Yonava in Lithuania, both of which were direct competitors with Bavaria, Austria, Czechoslovakia, and East Germany for scarce Ukrainian gas. In early November, the pressure in the pipeline in uh, to Yonava decreased from 12 to 6 atmospheres, jeopardizing ammonia production. Similar emergencies troubled uh, the Ministry of Ferrous Metallurgy, uh, whose Ukrainian enterprises received their gas at rates far below what they had been promised. In early December 1973, uh, Ukrainian party secretary uh, Alexei Titarenko wrote that the situation in Ukraine, despite measures taken by Gosplan and Gosnab in October, had become extremely strained. In Moscow, uh, uh, party leader Brezhnev uh, began to receive desperate letters from inhabitants in the regions most severely hit by the crisis. One of the most troubled towns was Galicia's historical oil capital, Drahubic, which was now located on the export pipeline route uh, to Western Europe and thus had to compete for its gas with Czechoslovakia, Austria, and Germany. And here I have a longer quotes. Uh, uh, from this uh, from this letter, it's been written that since four years already, we endure a disaster situation during the autumn winter uh, period. So this is the same period uh, during which uh, the Soviets have actually then started to export natural gas to uh, to Western Europe. Right? Uh, during the since four years already, at this time of the year, uh, the amount uh, of gas delivered is insufficient for supplying dwelling houses, uh, children institutions, 
uh, medical and administrative facilities. Houses are very cold and since apartments are not designed to be heated by, by firewood or coal, it is impossible to cook. As a result of these conditions, uh, grown-ups, uh, not to mention children, often fall ill. It is impossible to continue living like this. So as you understand, uh, my point here is that this situation could actually have been avoided if the Soviet Union would not have been so eager to uh, export natural gas already in the years around 1970. Uh, the local crisis in Western Ukraine uh, was an indirect result of Moscow's decision to prioritize exports over domestic needs. Now, the Soviet archival sources uh, are not very good for uh, the period after 1974, 1975. So I, I haven't been able to uh, reconstruct what actually happened in Ukraine afterwards. Uh, but uh, I'm sure people who lived there at the time will be able to tell stories that are very similar for uh, the period until the collapse of the Soviet Union and later on as well. It would be interesting if someone would like to explore this further. What we know for sure is that Ukraine in the course of the 1980s became uh, the key transit territory for, so for Siberian gas on its way to Western Europe. Uh, in the way that Soviet gas visionaries had dreamt of in, in the 1960s already. Uh, and this then became the very backbone of, of the Soviet West European gas export infrastructure. As we know, uh, however, uh, the Soviet Union was then uh, ultimately dissolved in December 1991, and Ukraine then became an independent country. This uh, marked uh, the starting point for a new chapter in the, in the history of Ukraine as a central player in the pan-European gas system. That's a chapter that is more well known, I believe, and uh, I will not spend uh, time on it here, although we can, of course, uh, uh, discuss it um, afterwards here. Um, but I can uh, recommend uh, uh, some other uh, writings on this, uh, like uh, Jonathan Stern's works, and also, uh, uh, Margarita Balmaceda's books. Uh, one interesting aspect that is uh, not so often emphasized, however, is that Galicia as a gas region, uh, which has been uh, at the center of my talk today, it actually continues to uh, to play a role in um, in um, uh, in the pan-European gas system. And it, this might seem paradoxical uh, in view of the fact that Dashava and the other uh, classical gas fields in Western Ukraine, they have more or less been depleted by now. Uh, but they continue to play an important role uh, because uh, the very same historical gas fields that I've talked about today are now used as gas storage facilities. So you pump down gas instead of extracting it. Uh, uh, store the gas in the in, in the empty uh, field. That's a kind of uh, typical way of storing gas. Uh, and the Ukrainian gas industry uh, has actually invested heavily in them, as you can see here, and they uh, plan to uh, continue doing so. Uh, in this way, Galicia, uh, in a similar way uh, to, for example, the Netherlands, has got a kind of second life, uh, so to speak. Uh, many West European gas companies uh, nowadays they profit from the availability of these gas storage capacities, which are really among the largest storage capacities in, in the entire European system. And my prediction is that uh, for this reason, uh, whatever happens with Russian gas exports to Europe, uh, Western Ukraine in this way will anyway continue to play an immensely important role in the pan-European gas system for the foreseeable uh, future. Thank you so much. Uh, that's all from me right now. And uh, uh, I look forward to discussing this uh, and uh, probably many other things uh, with you. Um, thank you so much, Per. Um, that was that was great. Um, so uh, for the Q&A, um, people can either use the raise hand function or you can put your um, your comments or questions directly in the chat box. Um, and uh, the one wrinkle here is that um, we have to unmute you. So please uh, somehow indicate your um, desire to ask a question to us um, and we will 
make sure that you can do so. Um, okay, so I have a question here from um, Ava N. Um, are there enough reserves in the Western Ukraine storage facilities to tide Ukraine over in this winter, assuming that the gas can be transported where it's needed? Now, let's see, are there enough reserves? Uh, are there enough reserves in the Western Ukraine storage facilities to tide Ukraine over in this winter? Um, uh, well, I, I'm afraid, uh, as an historical, I'm perhaps not the best person to uh, uh, to answer that. Uh, but uh, what I know is that, I mean, these uh, storage facilities are really very, very big. Uh, uh, um, so, they, so they do play an important role. And, and many actors, not only in Ukraine, ha have an interest in, in, the, in these uh, uh, facilities. I think that I have been unmuted so I can ask my question. Thank you so much, Per. This was wonderful. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about this paradox that you mentioned at the beginning of your talk um, when you said that Ukraine continues to honor the contracts that it has with Russia to allow natural gas to be transported through its territories um, despite the ongoing invasion. Um, and I just wondered to what extent this is something unusual. Is this what countries always do when they have some um, actual role to play in the generation of revenue for a country that is attacking them? Do they typically honor those contracts or not? Is is you is this a subject of debate in Ukraine whether or not to continue to honor these contracts? Are there many other um, energy related contracts that Ukraine is continuing to honor as well, or is natural gas in some way specific? Just really any commentary you might offer on this would be great. Thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm I'm, I'm intrigued by by this. Uh... Well, a paradox, actually, um, and um, I, I think it's uh, I think it's pretty unique. I I, I cannot uh, recall having read anything in energy history anything similar uh, elsewhere in in the world in any other war. I mean, uh, it would uh, seem self evident that I mean, if you are at war with someone, you don't uh, you don't at the same time. Uh, engage in uh, in in, in, uh, in profitable business relations. So it's uh, as if, uh, in this case, uh, uh, geopolitics, military affairs have been like decoupled from some uh, some business links. It's 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 truly fascinating. Uh, um, uh, I mean that that's that's the perspective that we can uh, allow us to to uh, to take, sitting here in, uh, uh, in in safe parts of the world, right? Uh, but uh, I mean, I, what we can say for sure is uh, also that I mean, uh, everyone understands that uh, that the countries uh, uh, that use uh, this gas that transited uh, through Ukraine, this uh, essentially Austria, uh, Italy, uh, and uh, I don't know if also uh, I don't know about Hungary. I, I suppose yeah, Hungary obviously uh, is another country. Uh, uh, Slovakia also, and so on. Uh, there, so there are, there are numerous EU member states which which have have a kind of ex existential interest in in uh, in, in, in um, keeping this uh, system in operation, and they obviously put pressure on uh, on Ukraine to you know not to uh, not to disrupt the flow. Although at the same time, Ukraine of course uh, uh, actively uh, tries to con uh, tries to convince. Uh, uh, Europe to, um, uh, to to abandon their imports of uh, Russian natural gas. So it's uh, there are many actors involved. Uh, there, there, and uh, there are many contradictions uh, which involve you know both uh, politics and economy. And there are some technological aspects as well, I believe. Uh, maybe if there are no other questions for the moment, I can use moderator privilege to ask my own, um, which is. Uh, Basically, how how is the situation that you're describing changing as um, many countries around the world turn to more sustainable sources of energy? And like, is there, you know, does does Ukraine's long history 
as a um, natural gas supplier to West and East Europe? Like, does that stand to change with the introduction of more uh, sustainable technologies for um, supplying energy? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, that's, that's that's a very interesting question, and um, I mean, we live in a uh, world in uh, a crisis. Uh, uh, there are many, there are multiple crises going on, and actors try to cope with uh, with uh, several crises at at one and the same time. Uh, it often uh, uh, creates difficulties to to discern. Okay, what are what are we actually doing, and what are the aims, and so on. Um, so in Europe, uh, there is. Um, uh, now there's a lot of focus on uh, energy security, uh, apparently. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there's a focus on uh, dealing with the, with the climate crisis and uh, decarbonizing the uh, energy system. So, uh, 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 and uh, and um, Europe would Europe would clearly like to abandon natural gas uh, altogether. Uh, natural gas is, after all, a uh, a fossil fuel, so it doesn't fit into a into a decarbonized world. Uh, but then there is a lot of debate on uh, how fast it should be uh, abandoned. Some uh, actors uh, argue uh, that natural gas is absolutely needed uh, to balance uh, intermittent uh, solar and wind uh, production. So it's it's a kind of very flexible uh, source of power, uh, uh, and. Um, so it's clear, clear natural gas will be the kind of the last uh, fossil fuel to be phased out. Uh, but uh, but there are many disagreements about well whether or not to support uh, investments in new uh, uh, gas infrastructure. So should we invest also in like uh, in 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 uh, exploration and uh, prospecting and exploration and so on uh, or. Should we build? Uh, should the EU financially support uh, new uh, LNG terminals, uh, new pipeline projects, and so on? Uh, that would, I mean, supporting fossil fuel projects is so sensitive in Europe that it's it uh, it uh, it gives rise to a lot of uh, to a lot of conflicts. Um, uh, so so um, and, and and I think this is this makes it interesting to speculate about the future of uh, of uh, Russian natural gas in. Uh, uh, in Europe and uh, also about uh, the potential future role of Ukraine and this. I mean, we can, for example, imagine that maybe in uh, a few years uh, in the post-Putin uh, Russian times, uh, it will be very tempting for uh, European gas users to uh, try and uh, rebuild uh, the, the um, uh, profitable links with the Russian gas sources. I mean, the geology has not changed. Uh, geology doesn't care about geopolitics. Siberia natural gas, it's still there. Uh, it, and it's, 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 uh, it's uh, conveniently available uh, through uh, uh, already existing uh, pipelines. It can, it can be easily accessed. It can be much cheaper than importing you know, LNG from the US or something like that. Um, uh, so uh, the question is, I think, uh, how these uh, future prospects will interact with, with the climate ambitions. Uh, I think uh, today it's, I mean, it's still too early to, to determine what, what the outcome will be. Um, so another question from the chat. Uh, Don Van Ada asks, uh, or first says, thank you for a very interesting talk. And then asks, I'm thinking about the hurry to get gas exported in the early 1970s. Do you happen to have any idea how important gas was in Soviet foreign trade at that time? Uh, was there a foreign exchange crisis more than usual, for instance, to pay for grain imports? Uh, or was it mostly to block like Eastern Bloc countries? Yeah, so uh, natural gas uh, at that early time uh, was not uh, at all important in the um, Soviet trade balance. Uh, they were just starting up exports so so it was like uh, more or less negligible and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, but uh, but but there were uh, there were these visions about well maybe uh, uh, natural gas could become much more important in uh, for for the soviet uh, for the soviet um, uh, trade balance in the future uh, but the, the as in my interpretation the the kind of uh, the what, what what would you say the the most active um, uh, supporter of of uh, 
or gas export. It was the, the Soviet gas ministry itself. And from the point of view of the ministry, the purpose of, of gas exports was actually to, uh, to, uh, uh, to get funds, uh, hard currency, which could be used, uh, as I have said earlier, uh, to uh, import uh, Western technology. And in that way, construct uh, at a faster pace uh, the uh, internal domestic Soviet uh, gas system. So, so, uh, so, so for uh, for the for the for for Gazprom, I mean, it's it's predecessors, <laughs> the the Minister of Gas Industry. Uh, the the purpose of export was to to actually increase the prestige, if you like, of, of natural gas in the Soviet Union itself, and, and and to increase the share of natural gas in in the Soviet energy mix. Uh, let me let me call in Jillian one more time. Thank you. Um, I will ask another question. I was particularly intrigued uh, by the fact that the facilities in Ukraine that had been used for natural gas extraction have been repurposed as storage facilities for natural gas that's now being piped in from Russia and stored in Ukraine on its way Um to Western Europe. And I just wondered if there, if you happen to be aware of other instances of um, extraction facilities being repurposed in that way, is that something that happens frequently in energy industries? Um, and in any case, are, are you aware of other areas in Europe that had been um, producing regions of natural gas that have now been able to that you know the the resource itself is maybe gone now, but those facilities have been repurposed as storage facilities. Is this part of a broader um, story of things that are happening or that could happen? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, that's very interesting. Uh... I mean, energy storage it's uh, it is becoming a huge uh, topic in the energy debate these days uh, uh, we have i mean a debate in the renewable uh, energies right where uh, this is the kind of uh, the, the really big i mean if anyone if anyone can solve the problem of storing electricity uh, that that will i mean pave the way to the future basically uh, and and the, uh, some energy sources are more difficult to store than others. And apart from electricity, this actually concerns uh, natural gas. I mean, if you want to store coal and oil, you can just you know <laughs> you, you just uh, you, you can create a heap of coal. It's no problem, and you can put oil into uh, you know uh, caverns uh, and so on. But uh, natural gas is more difficult to store right? because it's gaseous, uh, and. Um, uh, and so the traditional, uh, I mean, the method that has been uh, become most uh, popular is uh, precisely to use uh, to use uh, old uh, gas fields for uh, repurposing them, as you say, for um, for storing gas. And this is actually something that happens to many depleted gas fields uh, all over the world. And in Europe, uh, this is especially the case in the Netherlands, uh, which was. Uh, until recently, one of the most important uh, gas suppliers uh, over here. Nowadays, uh, the Netherlands has really repurposed itself as um, as a place where natural gas can be stored. And um, uh, more broadly, I mean, natural gas storage is also very much at the center of the European uh, energy debates uh, today. I mean, nowadays we can, I mean, from, I mean, actually, it's only during this year, basically, <laughs> Uh, fo following the, uh, I mean, Russia's uh, assault on Ukraine, I mean, we have we have uh, seen uh, natural gas storage becoming a kind of big topic being discussed uh, in, in, uh, I mean, in general media. We see, I mean, everyday <laughs> updates about how, to what extent are the storage uh, facilities filled and so. On. So it's uh, it's interesting how this part of the system is being so much emphasized now. Um, okay, great. Um, another uh, question from Hilda. Um, in the in the chat, uh, thank you for a timely informative talk about how the Soviet Union used Ukraine for colonial extraction of resources. 
Perhaps you have some idea of the extent of GDP that gas sales abroad generated historically. Oil is much more important for the Russian GDP. Yeah, I think that's uh, true. Uh, I'm not an economist, uh, but uh, this uh, is what I have also understood that it's, I mean, oil has been historically much more, uh, much more important, uh, clearly. Um, um, uh, uh, but but there has always been this uh, this vision that that well uh, we need to diversify. I mean, if you are in the Kremlin, you have always thought like this. We we need to uh, we need to sell not only oil, um, um, and then the gas sales have been very much modeled uh, after uh, model on on uh, on oil sales. Uh, um, I I'm, sh- I'm afraid I don't have any numbers uh, on this. Uh, uh, but um, but uh, uh, but uh, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm I'm not sure I can say uh, so much more about it. But uh, there there should be economists, you know, <laughs> who know better. Um, I think I'll ask I'll, I'll also ask one more question if that's okay with everyone. Um, so I I was just wondering like how um how much of the, you know, obviously like the war has exposed the, how deeply intertwined um, countries in Europe are with Russia um, in terms of just like energy dependence. Uh, And I'm just, I'm wondering uh, about the piece of the story that has to do with uh, natural gas in Ukraine. Like how, how, what was in place before the start of the war that has, that is kind of like in that vein um, of just like, of just showing how um, I guess, uh, entwined and interdependent, like things that were in place in this area of, uh, of gas exports before the war that sort of like in retrospect, it's clear that they are now exacerbating this like overall, you know, huge energy question mark. Um, yeah, well, uh, I mean, Russia has been uh, uh, Immensely important uh, for 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 Western Europe, uh, not only natural gas, but but uh, I, I I I think before I mean at one point I don't know uh, if it's valid for twenty twenty one, but uh, but but basically we can uh, uh, say that uh, Russia has been the most important supplier of uh, natural gas to the EU, and then also the most important of uh, most important supplier of oil. Uh, the most important supplier of coal and the most important supplier of uh, uranium. So it's 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 all over the place. Even biofuels, I say. I think. Uh, I mean, uh, 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 um, uh, bioenergy. It's 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 uh, right. Russia is also there. So, mm-hmm. so uh, uh, and uh, um, obviously there has been a kind of well. Um, uh, well, on 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 the one hand, it it has there has been this feeling that okay, it, it works well, so let's continue and let's scale up. And then on the other hand, there has always been this fear that well, something could go really wrong here. And um, uh, the question for the future is uh, if we are really uh, seeing a kind of end of this regime now, or if this. Uh, uh, these bloody uh, events, uh, this uh, tragedy that's now playing out, uh, if this uh, will be remembered as the end of things, or or if it, or if the uh, geology will, in the end, have the kind of last word and attract actors on all sides to uh, to kind of rebuild an energy exchange regime. Yeah, I think it's um, it's for me, it's like it's fascinating. Um, just how much of this situation like lived as a specter in people's minds. Like there was this um, Norwegian TV series, Okupert, that came out uh, well, like several years ago. I think it started in 2015. And like the whole premise, I don't know if people have seen this show, but like the whole premise was that Russia decides to invade Norway when Norway discovers uh, like, sust- like a fully sustainable um, energy resource on its own territory. So there's like clearly... And then, you know, like sequel I uh, ensue. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just like, it's very clear that like this has been on people's minds, but now somehow now, I guess there's still, uh, there's confusion about how to mitigate the situation. 
when it's actually happening. Um, so I can, uh, I can add, uh, I mean, one kind of longer historical perspective is, uh, of course, that uh, 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 Europe and Russia have uh, uh, traded uh, natural resources for, uh, I mean, centuries. Uh, there's a very interesting um, uh, chapter or, um, uh, uh, I mean, several uh, several texts by, by Alexander Etkin, for example, on the history of, of, of a fur exports from Russia to, uh, to Western Europe, which is, uh, in a way, perhaps the origin of, 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 uh, of, of European um, resource dependence on uh, on Russia. And then it continues later on with, with grain, continues with oil, uh, and, uh, that we have all the rest, uh, natural gas, uranium, coal, uh, metals, uh, you name it. So, so if if this if this trade would really come to an end now, uh, that that's a, a really uh, decisive uh, and very dramatic uh, disruption of of, of uh, many centuries of of uh, of, uh, of east west uh, resource trade. Uh, yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, that's that may be part of the reason that it's um, like so difficult to predict what will happen, precisely because the these relationships are are in some cases centuries old. Um, well, uh, so I, um, I I invite anyone who still has a question to please uh, raise their hand or ask it in the chat. Um, but so far, I'm not um, I'm not seeing any more interventions. Um, pause <laughs> to see if anyone wants to ask something. Um, yeah, so maybe then we should. Um, we should thank our speaker. Thank you so much, Pear. Um, thank you so much for being with us. And thank thanks to all of you for um, attending this talk. And thank you once again to the Jordan Center and Sasha Spitalnik for making this possible. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was great.